Hello, everyone. Due to the fact that we're still dealing with all this wonderful COVID stuff and so many folks are in lockdown or showing symptoms or at the doctor and we're unable to hit this lab, this is some pretty key concepts. So I put together a very, very short, and I promise you, very short slideshow on uh, the key concepts of uh, using diversity indices and what this will mean in uh, or aquatic studies, please, um, if you haven't read the SQA article, uh, and it's followed up by the uh, Shannon Weaver diversity article, which is which this is all about, um, please do so. You will find those on the Blackboard page under content folders under uh, the laboratory materials folder. Hopefully you recall from general ecology, that generally diversity is the measure we use as how strong a community, community health. Uh, if we see a very diverse community, lots of species present, a highly interactive trophic web with a lot of alternative opportunities for what you can eat or where you can live and all this stuff, that's an indicator. I mean, this is, this, this is a non sequitur. We can see that coming out of the blocks. Now, this idea of diversity, um, we typically are going to talk about that in terms of species richness. Just simply, I mean, when we reduce it to the simplest, we're saying, what is the... Uh, you know, what species are present. If we look at two communities here, cunningly labeled community one and community two, we would say, wow, community one has six taxa, community two has three taxa. So community one, we would have to say, would be the healthier community. In a way, this is what we're doing with the SQA type of indicators. We're simply saying the more taxa you have, the healthier the system, even though we're weighting it a little bit by what we consider indicators of good quality and poor quality. So we're dealing with the relative abundance of the species. How many? The more species, the better. And yes, this is undeniable. Usually, the more species, the better, the more diverse. The other thing, though, that we can look at once we make the step into quantitative sampling, where we're using equivalent effort and actually counting the number of organisms. Now, reflect back on how up on the canal in Oriskany Creek, we just collected organisms, a few of each. And on Callahan Brook, we were very careful to have the exact same amount of effort two square feet of sampling upstream and two square feet of sampling downstream. We collected every organism you saw and then we counted them. So as long as we are doing this, you know, a good legitimate quantitative sampling, species evenness might tell us something. So if I look at species evenness as a measure of niche quality, now I look at the same graph that I just did, and here I can see that, yes, community two has fewer taxa than community one, but generally all those niches are fairly well represented, right? The number of organisms that we take in a sample is going to be an indicator of niche quality. So in this example, we might say, all right, both systems are equally diverse in relative abundance. Both communities have six taxa present, but also both communities are equally represented in their numbers. So these would be two comparable communities. In this example, we see something completely different going on. Now, we, in both communities, still have six taxa. So if we were doing an SQA here, we would get the exact same number. Say that taxa A is a group one organism and got three points, and B and C were um, group two and got two points, and then group D, E, and F 
were or, uh, group three and got one point, you would see that we would have three, seven, ten. Both would achieve a score of ten and appear to be comparable. But when we actually look at the numbers, we look at tax A, say those are mayflies. Doesn't matter if you get 18 mayflies or if you get four mayflies. However many mayflies you get, it's going to have the same number. You'll get one, you know, three points for that. So we want to have some better way to quantify this. Because honestly, if we look at this, are these two ecosystems comparable? Community one has very equivalent strength in the niche for A, the niche for B, the niche for C. None of those have a competitive advantage over the others. None of them are favored. If all of these were food for some carnivore and a disease wiped out taxa A, the carnivore would then still have plenty of food for taxes B, C, D, E, and F. Now imagine community two. There is a great disparity occurring here. Community A is very strong. It is in an optimal niche for the, con or uh, rather, you know, the community it's living in, the ecosystem it's living in, is providing it an optimal niche. So it is flourishing and it's taking up, you know, the bulk of its community resources. B, C, D, E, and F aren't doing very well. They're barely represented, very low numbers very few of them out there. If something happened and took out tax A, uh, that would not necessarily spell. I mean, it could be a situation of competitive release. Competitive exclusion is no longer forcing those others down and they may take off. But if the ecosystem is just not the right habitat, if it remains a marginal habitat for them, we're in bad shape. So we can look at the idea of species evenness. The more even our species distribution is, that's going to be an indicator of more equity amongst the niches and a healthier ecosystem. So we want to bring in both of these ideas. There have been many um, efforts to come up with diversity indices. And the two that are most common are the Simpsons and the Shannon. And uh, there have been several iterations of Shannon, and the one known as Shannon Weaver tends to be, I don't know, my opinion, <laughs> my observations more commonly used. Now, keep in mind the whole idea of diversity and what this says about the habitat. Suppose you are observing a fish community. And in this fish community, you happen to observe 13 bluefish, six redfish, and one yellowfish. You don't know much about them. Trophically, ecologically, they're all about the same. You could make the statement that uh, you know, the bluefish definitely have the best niche. They are the most competitively strong. They have highest fitness. Redfish are moderate, and yellowfish are probably not in a very good niche. They are not competing very well in this community. But what can we actually, how can we quantify this? Almost every diversity index starts in the same place. Um, something we call probability of catch, which really is just probability. We use this lowercase p to indicate our probability of catch. And this is simply the number of observations in tax I divided by the total number of observations. Um, the idea would be that if you are in a class with 10 people and the teacher puts all your names in a hat, mixes them up, what is the probability of catch of your name being drawn? Well, it would be one out of 10 because there's 10 of you, 10 names, one divided by 10, you have a one-tenth you know, one chance of being drawn, a 10% chance of being drawn, something like this. So, if we look at this, we have 13 bluefish, six redfish, 
one yellow fish. So our total catch, our big N is 20. So our probabilities of catch, if, if you had all these fish in a collection, if you brought them in and had them in a bucket, swirled them around, and poor fish, and you put on a blindfold and reached in and ga grabbed one fish, what is the probability you would pull out a bluefish? Well, it would be 13 out of 20. You would have a 65% chance of drawing a bluefish, 6 out of 20, a 30% chance of drawing a redfish, and a 1 out of 20, a 5% chance of drawing a yellowfish. So this probability of catch is a good way that we can enumerate the representativeness. How well represented are bluefish? Well, 65% represented. The probability of catch is 0.65. So probability of catch is going to be our stepping stone for uh, moving into this, for moving into diversity indices. Simpson's index is known as the probability of similarity. Um, the idea being that the more similar taxa, the more similar organisms of one taxa are present, the higher the weighting. And this is how it was used. And the formula for Simpson's is just the sum of the probability of catches squared. So you take 0.65 squared and 0.3 squared and 0.05 squared and add them up. Our data in this example can show us exactly the problem that can occur with uh, Simpsons. If we look at our bluefish, then you know their probability of occurrence was 0.65. You square that, and you get 0.423. Still a big number compared to 0.65, so the bluefish are contributing heavily to the total index number. If you look at yellowfish, poor little yellowfish, 0.05, when you square that, you're going to get actually 0 0.0025, that rounds off here to 3, and so that's a little number. So if you're not well represented, your contribution to the index number gets even smaller. So if you start out insignificant, your probability of catch squared is going to make you even more insignificant. So that's the downfall right there is that we're not waiting well. But this is what Simpson said. He said if the, you know the more the you know more represented you are, then the more weight you should carry. But this is disregarding, you know, the number of species, the, the species richness. This is giving a lot of weight to species uh, numeric representation and not much weight to taxa niche representation. And the Shannon Weaver wanted to uh, compensate for that. What Shannon wanted to accomplish by developing this was a means to give more weight to niche representation. Okay, does that make sense? You wanted to give more weight to niche representation. So the fact that you are there, that your species is represented, your taxa is represented, that will add more value to the total uh, you know, to the total diversity index worth. So what he did was instead of squaring P, he took the logarithm of P. And don't freak out. I know he's done. The teacher starts talking logarithms, and everybody's like, whoa. -hoo! But all the logarithm is is expressing a number as an exponent. In this case, we're using natural law or uh, base 10 logs. So it's in expressing the number as an exponent of 10. So on your calculator, if you punch in 0.65 and hit log, you will get negative 0 0.187. Type in 0.3 and hit log or whatever the syntax, log 
point uh, point three parenthesis equals or whatever, it will be negative point five two three. And then if you look at um, the the point oh five, it comes out to a negative one point three one. So for reasons I'm I'm not going to get into this here, but one thing about using a log is that every zero you have, that leading zero to the right of the uh, decimal place, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.65 don't have that. We see 0 0.05 has one. So that leading number in a logarithm tells you how many places over there you go. What this does is it weights more. If we look at our yellowfish contribution and we're multiplying P times the log of P, we get 0 0.05 times negative 1.301, and that is a negative 0 0.065. Get it? If you flip back a slide and look under the Simpsons, where we took 0 0.05 and squared it, we got 0 0.0025. So under Simpsons, the small contribution of yellowfish got even smaller, carried even less weight in the total index. Here, okay, we don't have many of you, and we're reflecting your low numbers in P, but you're getting some weight, you, you get to express, you know, the value of your species being there, of your niche being represented by having the log P. And when we multiply those out, you know, what we see is, you know, negative 0.122 at negative point. 157, negative 0 0.065. So yeah, the yellowfish are still the most minor players here. There's the fewest of them, but uh, they do represent themselves more with a 0 0.065 rather than a 0 0.0025. All right. So then we add up those numbers. We take the sum of all of our p log p's, and we get negative. 0.344, and that's your fundamental index number. And because it's an index, an index is a number that really doesn't have intrinsic meaning. The meaning an index has is the number we assign it. So what happens here is that they said, let's just get rid of that. They took the absolute value, or they multiplied it by a negative, because that number's always going to be a negative. And then they multiplied that by 3.32. Now, there's a lot of, why should we use 3.32? That's just a magnifier. It's like if you put something on a dissecting scope, oh, I can't see it at zero magnification, and you crank it up to 10 power magnification, now it's too big, you back it off until you find a level of magnification that works. So through experimentation, they determined that if they use a coefficient of negative 3.32, the first thing it does is it gets rid of the negative, and the second thing it does is it will provide Shannon Weaver diversity values in the range of 0 to 10, where if you have a if you have just one species present, let's say you had 13 bluefish and only 13, 13 divided by 13 is 1, the log of 1 is 0, and 1 times 0 is 0. You would have no diversity. So in this case, uh, we get a diversity value of 1.14. And the idea here is that we are balancing the idea of species richness, how many different species we have, with that ecological integrity, the weight of their representativeness, how many are there. And this is a fairly commonly used indicator. Now let's give you some idea of how this might play out. Suppose you went sampling and you caught mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, alderflies, and timeflies, 
and you caught an equal number. Now, I used ones here. I said you got one of each. It wouldn't matter if you caught one of each, 10 of each, 100 of each, 1,000 of each, 7 of each, 13 of each. It would still be one-fifth for each one. So your probability catch is 0.2. You take the log. We see similar P logs. We multiply uh, P log times P, and then we get a 0.699. We multiply that by negative 3.32, and that gives us a value of 2.3206. Now, down below, suppose you went in and you caught the same five, but you got a thousand mayflies. Look how heavily that mayfly uh, proportion is. So here, we have a great mayfly niche, but the niche is poor for everybody else. So even though they would have equivalent SQAs, we would get a very low diversity number for that, okay? And uh, by the way, this is pretty easy to set up on Microsoft Excel if you want to play around. You can use my uh, numbers here as a reference. Now let's presume, or let's imagine, we are looking at seven communities, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now, in Community A, that was our most diverse, and we got five taxa out of there. Community G is the least diverse. It only has one taxa. Now, in each one of these samplings, each sampling of each community, we got the same number of organisms. We got five organisms. So in taxa A, we got five organisms representing five taxa. So that works out to be 2.32. This is just like our example of the mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, solderflies, and timeflies from the previous slide. Now, if I went to community B or looking at community B, I only get four taxa here. I am short on taxa. Having fewer taxa, I have fewer species and their niches represented. Uh, even though I have the same number of organisms, I would expect that diversity decreases, and it does. I go from 2.32 to 1.92. I see lower diversity. Now, if I were to have communities with only three taxa in it, three taxa representing five uh, organisms, or five organisms representing three taxa, excuse me, I could have taken two, two, and one, or three, one, and one. Now, having fewer taxa represented, right, I would expect to, you know, I have lower species richness, I would expect a lower Shannon Weaver, and I do. I went from, with five taxa, I had 2.32, with Four taxa, I had 1.92. And with three taxa, I have 1.52. Now, if we look at C and D, both have three taxa. But community C ha is much more even in its distribution. So its Shannon Weaver diversity index is greater, 1.52 versus 1.37. If I move on to communities, where I only have two taxa represented, my distributions can be three and two or four and one. And of course, with fewer taxa, I would expect to see lower diversity, and I do. I go from 1.37 to 0.97, and then community F, where there is four and one, a remarkably inequitable distribution. Uh, Taxo 1 is really dominating that community. My diversity index drops to 0.72. And then, of course, in taxa, or in uh, community G, with only one taxa available, that would be, you know, 5 divided by 5 would be 1. The log of 1 is 0. 0 times 1 is 0. So, 
our community diversity is zero. There is no diversity. The Shannon Weaver article that I ask you to read, it's pretty short, it's three pages, and you will see much of uh, all of this in there. Um, this slide I've actually did a cut and paste from it. This handout was developed by a guy by the name of Crunkleton who is at Ohio State University and uh, created this as a teaching aid. And his big thing was pollution monitoring. You know, this was mid 70s. So his big thing was uh, pollution monitoring. So he wrote this strictly from the aspect of uh, pollution. But we can broaden that concept or broaden our definition of pollution. You know, what is the impact? What has occurred upstream and downstream from the campus and aquaculture center inputs to the creek? Uh, what would happen to the ground cover diversity uh, before and after a clear cut? If you went into a forested region and did Shannon Weaver diversity index on your uh, ground cover, the area was clear cut, then you went back two or three years later and looked at the ground cover grass forbs, how has diversity changed there? One year, a long time ago for a project, I had students go over to the College Nature Center and they, you know, they would go twice a week. They did this for two months and they were observing and counting the birds using the bird feeders at the nature center and there was always very consistent numbers and species and then there in the spring they got this peak of where the shannon weavers jumped way up they were monitoring the spring migrations so they were able to use uh shannon weaver so um when we're using this for monitoring when you're using Shannon Weaver for whatever purpose, generally a single diversity value is meaningless. Its usefulness depends on comparisons with cal other calculated values. I could go in and, um, you know, if you look down at E there, I can say, all right, values will range from zero to 10. If it's less than one, it's pretty severely polluted or impacted or mitigated. Values one to three are moderate. Values greater than three have little or no pollution. Or, you know, you can just simply say less than one, an unhealthy ecosystem, one to two, a moderate ecosystem, two to three, average, and over three, very good, a healthy ecosystem. So, you know, read through these, understand that, you know, we can do it through time. Several values can be compared from a single station if they're over time. So we can do it temporally or we can do it spatially. Diversity values may be compared between different drainages or, you know, different areas as long as they're same physiographic region. Don't expect to have much meaning if you're looking at the benthos in a first order, or if you're looking at the benthos in a stream in New York and a stream in Florida. You're going to have completely different benthic assemblages. And also, uh, diversity values change with stream order. So, you know, it wouldn't have much meaning to take benthos out of Callahan Brook and compare that diversity with benthos out of the Susquehanna River. You know, or the Shemung flows into it. You know, that's huge. Sixth, seventh order river. So keep these in mind. Now there's uh, one last slide here I think I want to give you. This is an exercise on calculating Shannon Weaver diversity index that we did in the class. So I would like you to go ahead and work through this. I'm providing you all the numbers so you can check your math. Uh, but it's fairly easy. The first thing you do is you need to determine your total number. So if you, the column of N, add those up, you should get 134. Two divided by 134 will be 0 0.014925. The log of that is negative 1.826075. When you multiply P and log P together, you will get 0 
Do that for each row. Notice that if you have multiple rows where there's one, you don't necessarily have to uh, recalculate that. So the row that has four, then all the rows that have one, calculate it once. Once you have all of your P log P's added up or calculated, you add them up, and then you multiply that times negative 3.32, and that should be your H prime. Do that, and you should be calculating Shannon Weaver correctly. If you have any questions, as always, email me, put it up on the course room, on the bulletin board, come to office hours. I'm here.